so Carlo and I are going to talk to you about something that um, uh, I think is a fabulous addition to our products. And uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time on that, and I'm going to walk you through it. But first, a few things. So last night, the movie. Everybody enjoyed the movie? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Who, so Patrick <laughs> hadn't seen it in its entirety, and I think Karen had said only bits and pieces over the years. You had never seen it? And how'd you like it, sir? I love it. You loved it, right? It was great. So what I realized last night is um, I, uh, as I was watching it, I tend to draw parallels between life and my work. And it dawned on me that the dude is like the perfect network engineer, right? Nothing really bothers him. There's all sorts of stuff going on. He feels the pressure, but he gets it done, right? And Walter is kind of the perfect DBA. Is he not? I know I have a couple of DBAs here, right? You guys have been DBA before, a little bit. So Walter's the DBA, and of course, Donnie's the developer, and that's why Walter's always yelling at him to just shut up. So is the dude the sysadmin in this? <laughs> the dude network? is the network engineer, sysadmin. You'll take it. Yeah, you'll take it, right? Absolutely. Storage admin, whatever you want. <laughs> so um, the thing is, as I was kind of watching that, and I realized how it was all playing out, I realized, though, each one thinks that they're trying, or Walter and the dude, they're both trying to solve problems, but they're in their own silo. They're talking to each other, but they're not really listening. And when I think of my career, so about 20 years in IT, production DBA for seven, roughly. I'll, I'll say good years, why not? And um, I think about the silos that we had, and I think about observability. I, I think of all these different things in IT that we do. And we spend a lot of time building tools and processes to show that whatever's happening is not our fault. Right? As a DBA, I'm sitting there and I'm spending time saying, I'm telling you, it's not a database problem. <laughs> Am right? I wrong? Right. Not me. But, so think back to your careers. Whatever admin you were in at the time, that's usually what you, had. You're, you're in a room and you're like, I'm telling you, I got all the data here to tell you it's not my problem, it's somewhere else. And I see tools on the market and they talk about that where they'll say, hey, uh, we're going to help you find the root cause. We're going to help you find where the problem really is and all that. And, and I thought about that and I go, you know what you really want? If you're a sysadmin and you're using a tool, a suite of tools like SolarWinds, we have 50 products, right? If you're using this suite of tools, you know what you really need? <coughs> you don't need a tool that can tell you where the problem isn't. You need a tool that can tell you exactly where the problem is. If you're a network admin, would there be value for you to have a tool where you could know definitively it's a database problem and the DBA needs to go do some work right now. Would there be value if you're sitting there and it's on a dashboard and you're like, oh, I know it's a database problem and I know the DBA has to do some work. That's a little different than just saying it's not the network or it's not the storage. Right? That's why, remember, Stephen, I told you I'd call you out. It, as your career is the storage admin, don't you wish you would have had that all those years ago and said, no, it, I know it's a database problem and I can show you? Well, I wish I had the I can show you problem. Um, I never had the other problem, though, because it was a database problem. It was problem. always a database <laughs> problem. Yeah. Never a storage one. So let's go one step further. DNS. What if you didn't just know it was a database problem, but what if you could go to that DBA and say, hey, it's not just a database problem? but it's actually an anomaly. It's something different in the environment right now that you should look into. So there's two things. It's either it's always been a problem and you just never knew about it. That's the observability part, right? But what if you knew it was truly an anomaly? What if you could do some math on the data you have mm. and say, I'm telling you something is different about this and it is a database problem and tell your boss to make the DBA go do some work. That's what we're going to talk to you about right now. Ooh, really? Okay. Because the chat, as a as a consultant for some time, mm -hmm. a hard one lesson that it took me far longer than I care to admit to learn was that people get really grumpy when you try to solve their problem that they haven't asked you to solve. Fair. So, the the comment is people get grumpy if you're trying to help them solve a problem that they didn't ask you for help with. Mm. I feel that. I really do. But. Your problem, say, if you are the overall admin, you really need to understand where the issue is. And you want to help and say, look, I have some data for you. What we're going to show you is that we're going to use a little data science. We're going to do a little uh, predictive analytics, 
and we're going to talk a little machine learning. And that's the part where I'm telling you, it's not just a gut feeling. It's not just me with running some queries saying, no, I can tell the weight stats here or whatever. There's an anomaly here. Right. And I'm not even going to help you try to solve it. I just want you to know that I see an anomaly. The computer you're like, says no. Yeah, you're like Jordy LaForge. You're like, I, got, I detected an anomaly. We're going to run a level five diagnostic and we're going to get this solved. Hey dude, the system says you're incompetent. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to show you, so if you're familiar with our tools, what you're looking at here. We're not showing that yet. <coughs> we're not showing anything yet? Yeah, I just brought it. Just Carlos face. Just Carlos face. All right, so now we're showing it? Now we're showing it. So what, you sh what you're seeing here is I wanted to point out Inside of Orion, this is the high level. Is this a touch screen? It is not. <laughs> I know, right? It's just like a Mac. I need a mouse. I, I can't work without a mouse. So what you're looking at is a high level view of databases summary inside of the Orion dashboard. And on the right, we have the integration module to DPA. So DPA is Database Performance Analyzer. Uh, I've been working with DPA now for about nine years. And it is a tool that actually changed my life. It, allowed, it gave me the observability inside of a database to really fix any sort of problem across platforms. So I still had to do some SQL Server and some Sybase, and it made my life a little bit easier. Uh, you can integrate that into Orion. So if you're familiar with the products, you can get some observability. So on this page, if there was an issue, I would, I would see some red here down on this particular database server, and then I would build some reports. Where's my perf stack? There it is. And this is what I want to show you. So inside of the perf stack, if you're familiar with that, I think you've seen a couple of demos on that. What we have now is we've integrated the wait time status. And what you see is that part that's red, that's an anomaly. And that anomaly is in the critical state. That means that we have done a baseline. We've done, now this is predictive analytics. We have a baseline. We know how much wait time there should be for that instance at that time of day, week, month, year. And we can do a little math. And in that math, we can say, all right, am I two sigmas away from standard deviation? Three, four, how far away am I? That is more than three, right? The two is Correct. the credit, yeah. Three. That is more than three standard deviations away. In other words, that's what? Less than 1%? So we know that there's something really different about that. Now, if you're the network admin, you're seeing something going on. You're looking in the app stack view. You're seeing something red. You are just two clicks away or one perf stack report away from seeing this thing. And now you go and tell the DBA, hey, there's an anomaly there. There's just something different. Are your customers complaining? Is there anybody, are you seeing any issues? Are you, anything going on there? Now you have that observability. That signal through the noise, right? So from PerfStack, now you can go over into DPA. This is what it would look like for the DBA. You would see the wait time for the bars itself, and then down here you see, if I hover over it, what does it say? More than three standard deviations away. So you can see right here, that big bar, that's the deviation. So something within a couple standard deviations, we'll leave that green. We'll say, that's okay, you expect things. So you gotta track that over time. Then a little bit of critical, or I'm sorry, a little bit of warning, a little bit of critical. You've got a certain amount of weight that was way longer than expected. This gives me a lot more context than just this. Because when you look at this regular thing inside DPA, every bar you see is a specific query, an aggregate amount of weight for that query at that particular time slice, right? What you're seeing now though, I have no idea if this is normal. I have no idea if this is normal. This tells me if it's normal or not very quickly. So if this is all flat, I would just look and go, that's a normal workload. So if we're having a problem, we should go fix it, but we should understand it's always been a problem, right? So that chart yes. on the bottom is measuring total wait time aggregated from above? This is the delta between the actual and predicted wait yeah, time. Yeah. Right. So we know how much weight, so that zero represents, we know exactly how much weight there should be. And at that moment, there was this amount over that. Got it. Yep. Okay. Now, I think I have one more screen. No. That's, always, that a, that's always a running relative view. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, that would be a trend view. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a 24-hour slice, but you can zoom in or out as needed. 
And these are specific in this demo. These are specific to this server or this database. Yes. I'm yes. Uh, server. This server. Is, this, yes. So all databases on that. That's server. right. Yeah. In in DPA, it's almost always an aggregate view. You're always looking at a uh, totality. So in this particular case, uh, if you look at the bar up here, top sequence uh, statements. That's for the instance. So this is across all databases. So you can drill from there. So you can figure out which database okay, is actually doing that. And yep. then what if it hit the, I see there are negative numbers. So negative weights. Would that ever hit an abnormal? <laughs> That's uh, this no. is a curiosity. A no, it is a delta, but I don't believe we alert on that. We only alert on the over. I'm going to let Carlo talk I more know. about the math behind yeah, it. Carlos is our distinguished cool. engineer that uh, spent a lot of time doing the data science-y part. Uh -huh. But uh, I believe I have that right. We don't alert on the negative. Uh, yeah, that particular is not a negative. That just means it's below the prediction. That means yeah, we, we've made a prediction, and yeah. let's say we predicted 400 seconds I of wait it. time, and you hit 300 seconds, yeah. so you're just below. And uh, for wait, we don't consider that a bad anomaly because <laughs> less less wait time or on your not, database. Not it could be a, a whole thing. Thing. It's not always a good thing because that means you're having less true. traffic. Yeah, yeah right? I mean, if, you, um, if your query was zero because nothing came back, it was like, oops. Yeah. Or, or mm -hmm. yeah, users yeah. are down. Or something. Yeah. yeah. On that, yeah. I just, yes, down, I from an ops management perspective, like this is reminding me, I can't remember the term of art, but it reminds me of Six Sigma type stuff where you've got your control range and then if it's outside however many standard deviations, then the system is out of control. And too few, like if the, if the wait time is way too small, that is actually out, of, it's an anomaly. Yep. So I, for some of that, I might actually care because it, it may well mean something is wrong. It's like someone just dropped the table and now I, all my queries are incredibly fast because there's no data. Hooray! Right. <laughs> That's not actually a good thing. Correct. So, yeah. So I, or even if something agreed. just changed the and there was no change control done, yeah, and so that that's a bigger. You know, it doesn't have to be a problem, even if it's a green, even if the the delta isn't a problem. But now my the deltas are consistently different than what they used to be. What I should be predicting from the yeah. past, but there was no change control done. But something changed. It's a good way to say, hey, something changed. Let's get in front of yeah, it. Yeah, well, there is a problem. Right. Something's right? different. So it's not always about ah, things are on yeah. fire. So the math is all done for that. So we actually you have step the, up, I'll step the, the data science is going to do, and I'll. We brought the whiteboard for me, so I yeah. can explain the math behind it, and the math is there. The productization, it's a great idea, so as we get more feedback from our users, if we start to say, no, low is bad too, start to show us red when it's too low, we can productize that as, a, as well, but we have the math. So let me step okay. over to the whiteboard. Yeah, and, and if you could, at some point, can we loop back around to how we uh, view this if I'm trying to manage hundreds of servers and hundreds of databases? I mean, it's neat that I can drill down to one, but I may have several hundred in my environment, and I need to know how they're all performing. Yep. You want to answer that while I draw, sure. some, I mean, draw some things? So there's a couple of different ways depending on, on your role. But for DPA, you would be looking at the main home screen, and everything that you have registered would be down here. And this, is, this weight is actually going to include the anomaly detection for you, and you could sort by these. Okay. So at the, this is at the instance level. Of course, you have to drill into there to get to the database level. But the dashboards inside of the main Orion platform would also have things. Are you familiar with the app stack view? What? Yeah. Let me see if I can get the, bring that up real quick. Uh, I know that there's one. I have to find where I am inside of this. <laughs> I wanted to show AppStack, Carlo. Where do you have that hidden down here? Go to my dashboards. Yeah, don't you have one for? Environment. Environment, of course, because I should translate environment to be AppStack. Uh, this would give, we don't have a lot on this one. The main uh, demo would have more. But this is where it would show up, and you would see everything related. If I highlight one thing, I would see the related entities to go with it. Uh, retrieving related objects that those went a little lighter. They got grayed out because they're not related. But in AppStack view, you would see your reds, your yellow, yellows, and greens, and you would know what's related. So there's a couple of different ways in the environment. Like you said, I have all these instances. Uh, you might be interested in clicking on one and seeing the related entities, or you might know storage is down. Click on storage, and you see, oh, this is now affecting my database servers. So we have a couple different views for that observability. Yeah, also on AppStack, It'll bubble up the things that are uh, having trouble at that specific moment in time. So you might have thousands of things in your environment, and it will bubble up only the things that are the most important or the most erroneous at, at the top of the app stack. So, and everything else that's green 
uh, just as hidden behind the scenes. That way it helps you manage hundreds or thousands of, of database instances or network devices or whatever you have. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. All right. So what we do and what we found within a lot of our customers' data is that there's distinct seasonality. So we have you know, your, your data, and your data goes up and down up throughout the day. And we break that down into three components. One is overall trend. How's your data going? Is it going up? Is it going down? Then we look at weekly seasonality. So generally, it's low on the weekends and spikes up during the work week. And we found this with a lot of our customers. And then daily seasonality. So the seasonality spikes up at night for the database backups and whatnot, and then up again during the day for uh, just the, the normal work day. So with these three components, we're able to make accurate predictions. What's left over is what we call noise. And this noise gives us the standard deviation of what's left over. And what we're able to do then is give you an accurate prediction plus some standard deviation of where we think you're going to be. And that's what you're seeing on the, on the charts. But Bring it back. you're saying, fancy math, Carlo, but that's not <laughs> machine learning, right? So well, I said that to you, yeah. yeah. So what we're doing in the background right now in DPA is we have multiple algorithms that are going on in the background. And we're not only saying, all right, what's your prediction? But as the data comes in for real, we're looking at that. We're calculating a delta and rating ourselves as far as how smart is our prediction? How well are we doing? And that's where we start to learn. Our analytics are now going to say, all right, our target's on or our target's off. So if we're off, what can we do? So we're going to have multiple algorithms then saying, all right, you know what? My other algorithm actually predicted here. And I had another algorithm that actually predicted here. And as we get algorithms that are more accurate, Behind the scenes, we'll start swapping out. And there, you have machine learning. We're actually teaching ourselves in the background what's more accurate and what's going to be better for your environment. Because your environment's different from everybody else's environment. So having the machine actually know what's going on in the background and changing itself, that's where we're getting machine learning. Any questions or jokes about that? <laughs> so Keith had a lovely Venn diagram. So let me dive in a little bit more on how we're looking at analytics at SolarWinds, and specifically within Orion. So we have three different things that we're looking at that we know about. One is your topology. Here, you think of AppStack, your relationships between your physical devices, networking topology, um, application dependencies, NetFlow. We know all of these different topologies within, within your environment. So we know the relationships between different things. Then we, of course, have classic time series, all of the numbers that we're gathering. And not times. Time series. series. Time series. This is why I do math, and I don't <laughs> do actual English literature. And we have the time series. And then, of course, we have events, what things are going on within the environment. So we're focusing on this center area of the Venn diagram, bringing all of these things together. Because what's going on in your environment? We're really looking at what changed. What did you do? Or what you didn't do, but maybe somebody else in your environment do, did. Right? Machine learning is all about looking at your environment, but ultimately, for our products, we need to guide our people into finding the root cause or finding the ability to solve the problem of what's going on. If everything is good, latency is low, no errors, saturation is OK. Those four golden metrics that Google taught us about, if that's OK, everything's fine. When something goes weird, why did it go weird? What changed? So what are we doing? We're looking at now events and logs. So let's draw a fun timeline where I have circle event, and I have square event, and I have circle event again, and I have square event. And these can be any sort of events. So when we detect an anomaly, that's an event. When we get a configuration change event, that's an event. And what we can do now is now 
start to rate events on how often they occur together. So if somebody changes the configuration and then the network level spikes or somebody changes the configuration and then the database time goes up, we have these correlations or what we term in data science co-occurrence fancy word. If I say a word that you don't understand, please raise your hand. I'll, I'll give you a test. Skewness <laughs> and kurtosis. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay, you're good. There we go. <laughs> Smoothing algorithms. Smoothing algorithms, yeah. These so all good things. we find the co-occurrence between all of these different events, and then we can start to chain them together and find for you what happened first in this series of events and actually teach the machine to start looking at those. And then afterwards, actually look at what you did in your environment. So Chris showed some lovely things about changing configurations. So let's say you change the configurations had a bunch of anomalies, and then changed the configuration again. Mm -hmm. Now we've just learned, oh, we know what's going on inside of your environment. We know what you did. We can help you solve this next time. So lastly, I'll talk about logs and what we can do there. So logs. Just before you. Go ahead. Just, yeah, quick question. Because before you were saying you have machine learning models that are trying to make a prediction about what the environment should look like, and then if it's out of out of control, if it changes, something happened. So some of that is deliberate. Like, so we will be actively changing IT environments all the time. That's what we do, and we're trying to improve it. How do how do you factor that into your prediction models so that you know that the model was wrong because something external changed, not because something is incorrect with the model. Right. How, how do you factor in that, you know, this is a good change and we, it's different on purpose, not different because the math is wrong? Yeah, that's a great question. We do a variety of things. So there's a bunch of approaches that we can do to look for good changes versus bad changes. Mm. And so we actually have different models specifically within time series, for example. We look and we see, is our prediction uh, accurate or more accurate or less accurate this week than it was in previous weeks. And if we're getting worse, then we can actually then compare these weeks to previous weeks and do a comparison and say, what if I just modeled on more recent data and compare models of using most recent data versus models of using longer time? Mm. And if we find that we're able to model more accurately with more recent data, then we decide to switch models or the, the machine will decide to switch models. Okay. And that way we're looking for specific changes within the environment in yeah. order to understand if something good or even something bad happened, we're able to change the duration of time that we're looking at and do comparisons in order to make a decided switch. Okay. So is it so you mostly favor unsupervised learning or supervised learning or do you have a mix of the two? Supervised learning is our number one priority right now because we don't have a lot of labeled data, nor do our users have a lot of labeled data within their environments. Mm -hmm. uh, most of our users in Orion don't go through and mark this was an anomaly or this was odd. Yep. Uh, it's something that we want to look at in the future so that as we come up with anomalies and we detect certain situations, we would like to ask our user, was this a real anomaly so that we can start to have labeled data? But we're really focusing on unsupervised learning models okay. right now. And because this is going into a SaaS service, you will eventually, you, you are gathering some of that data so you'd be able to make better predictions as your users learn from themselves about what this is. Yeah, the, okay. the challenge there, is also that we're designing algorithms that will operate in the SaaS environments, but also in the on-premises environments. And so on, in our on-premises environments, in our, like our government environments, we'll never see that data. Yeah. So we need to be able to have the machines actually learn locally mm -hmm. and then um, behave locally and, and do all of that completely isolated from everything yeah. else. As we have access to the SaaS data or we have customers who are willing to send their models up to the cloud for us to analyze, mm. we'll be able to provide more feedback as to if we have 1,000 customers, they all train different models in one way, they send that information up through our uh, Orion Improvement Program, and we analyze all of their models, then we're able to learn from everybody and, and put that back down. So mm. that's something that we're looking at doing. As so well. something that I think you touched upon and danced around, but we didn't 
actually say out loud, and I will, so it's recorded for all time. What I think you're really drilling into is the, uh, there's a fundamental issue to all this stuff, which is context. How do you apply context to what's actually happened? You've mm. got to be able to tell the machine, this is what we intended. Yep. And that's not an easy thing to get done. It's one of the biggest problems with time series collection is mm. you don't necessarily have the context of what was happening there. Yeah, because computers are incredibly stupid. Right. Um, and so we need to have some sort of human feedback into I'm not sure I have an answer. Uh, uh, but I mean, I, that, that I is a fundamental, does. yeah, that is a fundamental problem uh, for a lot of data science, actually, is, is what was the context that was happening here. It's, yeah. it's refreshing to have a vendor actually understand this and ex be able to explain it to an audience as well, which shows that you do actually understand what you do. I want that on the t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> well, the, I get a lot of briefings because AI and ML is very, very hot and VC are throwing way yeah. huge amounts of money into it. And most of it is nonsense. Um, the computers are not magic. So a lot of this is, okay, fabulous, you've got a linear prediction model. Congratulations, that's not AI. Um, but unfortunately, I think it's setting up people who don't actually understand the maths or haven't studied this in, in detail. The, they, the expectation of what it will do for you is much, much higher than what's actually possible. Um, and that is unfortunately meaning that they're not doing the basic stuff, which is actually incredibly valuable. Like even just having something which tells you this system is vastly, di like it's significantly different to what it was last week. Something changed. Maybe look at that. That's incredibly valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And just putting that in will give you so much value. It, it, it really will just change the way that you do stuff. So do that first before waiting for, you know, oh, no, the computers are just going to take my job away and do all of it for yeah. me. It's like, no, 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 that's not going to happen. Not, not within probably my lifetime. Yeah. So absolutely do this basic stuff. Yeah. No, I, I, I echo that all the time, that people confuse you know, AI, ML, yeah. deep learning, predictive analytics. And I, as you said, refreshing, I am ecstatic to be with a company that gets it mm. and is in front of people saying, here's the differences. I talk about all the time. I go, these are the differences and this is what we're doing and how it aligns. Because I've seen the same stuff. I've seen companies say, oh yeah, we're, we're doing some data science and machine learning. And I'm like, nah, yeah. you're yeah. not. What you've done is you've slapped some buzzwords on the feature, and That's but right. it's not really doing. Yes. Yeah. You've done some logistic regression and now you've just waved a bit of magic around it because you need more funding. Yeah. Okay. And I get it, but yeah, it's not actually helping us as an industry to do that. So we have five, less than five? We have about five minutes. Okay. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. So quick, quick point on your question is well, in the product, what we've wanted to do with the anomaly detection is not automatically trigger alerts for users, mm -hmm. but simply note it. So that's why you see in the UI, it's red, are you alerting on it? Up to you, right? All right. Pointing out that there was anomalies and actually getting you out of bed at 2 in the morning because there was an anomaly is a completely different thing. So just noting that there was an anomaly and then letting you decide as a user whether or not it's worth getting me out of bed after you've seen the system behave. Mm. Yes, those anomalies that you guys are finding are great. Get me out of bed. Or mm. no, they're just informational. Let me just... Uh, keep them silent, but they're useful for troubleshooting. Yeah, that's, and that's the direction. Most we're customers won't be ready for the alerting part yet because it will be such a big difference to have this kind of process control put in. Yeah. Um, it'll take them a while to get used to first. Yeah. Yeah. So one one last comment then on the machine learning is as we look at logs, everybody loves logs. Well, logs are really interesting for us because logs teach us or are events. We look at them based off of what's the context of the logs or what's in the logs. And then we also generate time series from logs. So we're looking at, all right, how often do I see the word error? What's the er rate at which I see? So we start to see logs as a set of time series and a series of events. And then we're able to, from the logs, start to generate even more insight because you're getting numeric analysis on top of the textual analysis. And that way we're going to be able to give you uh, even more analysis similar to what we're doing over here for DPA, log rates will give us an insight into what's going on in your environment as well and give us the same anomaly detection, but looking at logs as sort of an orchestral movement of things that certain things happening at certain rates will make certain music. This, this machine might be playing some Metallica and this machine over here might be playing some Mozart and then they switch in the middle of the day that, one starts playing Metallica. The one that was playing Metallica is now playing Mozart. And the one that was playing Mozart is now playing Metallica. And that's weird. And so we're looking at these 
logs as a way to look at things as, a, as an orchestra and we'll start to give you the analysis there and just bring it all together. So we're taking all of those different pieces and letting the machines learn and then hopefully give value to you so that ultimately you can have root cause analysis within your system where you know what happened first. So Chris changed the configuration and then everything went to Metallica mode where just things, everything. You know, <laughs> things are uh, now we have to use that somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then it's Metallica playing Mozart, but that's a different thing. Um, yeah. A quick question on why you chose to display your anomaly detections that way. Was there a reason that you didn't do like air bars with whiskers? Standard deviation I'm used to seeing more yep. presented uh, that way. A lot of user testing. So we had exactly what you described with the, with the whisker diagram. And we just went to users and basically showed them UIs like this and asked them to interpret it for us. So we said, all right, what does this mean? And most users were able to interpret this over all of the other ones. Oh, that's fascinating. Because yeah. for me, I look yeah. at it, that doesn't tell me that's a standard deviation. That tells no, me. it doesn't. Uh, no. Am, am I know, wrong? Or? No, you're not wrong. But okay. you also have experience in data science. Uh, no, not really. No? I'm just used to looking at stock charts that have standard deviations. Yeah. And so oh, okay. the finance industry, that's what it shows. I don't know, I don't know if I'm wrong, but... Yeah, no, I mean, no, you're yeah, not they, wrong. They, they, there's other ways... Finance, of, they do, yeah. it, there's clearly other ways of showing and displaying I it, mean, but that's... Yeah. One thing they could label. What I'm yeah. used to so, so, so two reasons. One, this particular approach uses standard deviations. Not all of our approaches do, nor will they all will. Okay. We'll start using some neural networks and some other machine learning algorithms that won't necessarily do that, but will still indicate anomalies. Okay. So in this specific case, that might be a better visualization for it. But we wanted to generalize it to as we swap out the algorithms underneath, mm -hmm. we wanted a consistent view. So what does this tell you? This, hopefully you look at this and you see red. Red is bad. And if you saw just a little bit of red, you'll say, oh, it's a little bad. If you see a lot of red, it's more bad. And so that was more of the... I, I have no problem with the, yeah. the stoplight approach. For, right, it's super useful yeah. for graphically getting information yeah. across. Right? But as, as we swapped out the algorithms and the standard deviation was not as important, we wanted to be able to echo the same message without necessarily telling Changing them what's the, the machine learning underneath. Yeah. Okay. Great. And of course, I, I always point out it's a bar chart. Everybody can, even managers understand the bar chart. <laughs> and I've yet to have a manager on a call say, I don't get what I'm seeing. Come on, you should switch it all to a pie chart. Big bar, bad. Big, big green right? is bad. Big green bars bad. mean bad. Something's different <laughs> there. And it's really, for most users, it, that is an easier thing to comprehend. Then when you get people with a little more experience, like, oh, wait. It, it actually, I'm losing something in translation because I'm expecting it presented in a different way. Yeah. OK. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, how long does it take uh, for you to take those models from all of the other customers and uh, apply them to uh, customers that don't send data up, uh, your federal customers or uh, customers who have a little more privacy? So uh, it depends on the type of data. Uh, this wait time with what we call high cardinality data, that means there's a lot of variation in the data. We need about three days to come up with a reasonable model and then three weeks to come up with a pretty dang good model and Oops. am i allowed to say that um yeah uh, <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> yeah, <do> it's already <laughs> recorded um and so what we're looking at doing is starting to come up with generic models that ship with product and so what we're finding is three weeks comes up with a good model that we would ship with all of the customers so that out of the box the product will actually ship with uh, things. So as soon as it classifies a certain time series as being a specific flavor, then it will say, oh, I know what flavor you are, and apply that model to it. Uh, we. I just had one quick Sure. Comment. So one of the ways that vendors can encourage companies to share those telemetry is to have a free version of the tool that requires that, right? Yes, that is a way. Of some tool. <laughs> To help train your models. I'm, I just want to make sure, Joe, you heard that, right? <laughs> we have so many free tools. <laughs> no, but I'm saying a free version of a tool yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. to train not, your models it's not is a very common it approach. My data. Yes. So we have so many free tools. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, when we're looking at, you know, things like this, it's sort of like how, you know, we began the day, right? We're going to continue to listen to, you know, feedback from our user community. Uh, when we're looking at it, if it is something that you know they think 
uh, is needed more within you know all of our product sets you know we might do something like that right and so you know without getting into and i i was joking about smoothing algorithms and all that but without getting into sort of the fancy nuts of even how dpa works if you think about it if there's more need for activities like this in other products let's say not just in dpa but in you know npm or you know i'm, I'm looking at it in my apm solution there's some there's some you know items that we can do like looking at anomaly of anomalies meaning like how many anom- anomalies do i usually get because yeah. that's going to happen in your environment and yeah. i usually have 15 and all of a sudden i shot up to 65 and now the accuracy of that uh, anomaly is you know super high all of a sudden right so it'll depend on what kind of approaches we end up taking to get there but uh, it's something definitely worth considering depending on the user feedback. Yep. Fortunately, our users are quite friendly and we've been able to build these models based off of a lot of information sharing already, both off of our SaaS products where we're able to look at the data anonymously and a lot of friendly Orion and DPA customers who are willing to give us uh, simple dumps from queries. So we actually have uh, thousands of data sets that we've been using to train up our models.